Hey, good morning. Um, we like to uh, get started. So this is the topic panel two, uh, methods and challenge. Um, yesterday, when we had a, a panel for neurophenomenology, I had my last slide, which was basically showing on that sort of data and the information from first person, uh, first person perspective on one side, and then data from third person perspective on the other side. And the purpose of neurophenomenology was to, to make a bridge between these two stream of data. And then the point I was trying to make was, you know, there are various ways of connecting these two streams of data. And not, not one of them is necessarily more valid or truer than other. Instead, these people who wrote this uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to Neurophenomenology basically made a point that uh, at the different stage of investigation, maybe one bridge is more appropriate and also necessary to do that. But then in the course of sort of doing research, you end up moving, sort of trying to create the different types of bridge. And ultimately you may have to do all of it to get the full understanding. So um, today's session, which is not really related to um, neurophenology per se, but uh, we're gonna be talking about variety of method and the challenges uh, sort of being faced by this use of different method. So you have to be kind of like uh, aware of what kind of method being used by these different researchers, and then uh, what are the sort of uh, pros and cons of uh, you know, using a uh, particular method of data acquisition. And then I wanna end with this metaphor of, you know, I think it was Heidegger or somebody like Heidegger. If you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? Because the only thing you can do is hit. So your method is basically is the strength of what you do, but it's also confines you because that's what you can do. You can't do anything else. So in that sense, it is very important in the context of doing empirical research. So we have four speakers for this panel. And the first speaker is uh, Dr. Jonathan Berger. And his title, uh, he's been introduced previously, but uh, I guess I'm go going to read his bio. Uh, for the sake of rec recording, you know, so uh, Jonathan Berger is a Dunning family provost professor in music at Stanford University and a composer and then a researcher of music cognition. Uh, professor Berger is a, a recent recipient of Guggenheim Fellowships and the Rome Prize. He currently leads a cross disciplinary uh, study of the interplay of architecture, acoustics, and music. The title of his presentation is uh, Developing an Ecologically Valid Method of Studying an Interaction of Architecture, Space, and Sound. So please. <laughs> Good morning again. Um, I'm not gonna talk um, about a lot of technical things because there are many smarter people in this room than I, and I rely almost entirely on my graduate students and colleagues. So, um, so um, it, I'm going to, um, I'm gonna sort of focus. I mean, I think the liturgy of, of, um, of uh, terms that will be thrown out include EEG, um, machine learning, you know, things that are sort of the parlance of what's going on here. And I will, you know, I can, I'm happy to talk about what we're doing with that, but um, but I'm really gonna focus today on the idea of um, the, that thin line between um, what's called in the wild or ecologically valid um, uh, experimentation and, um, and, you know, and how to, how to get there and how close we can get there. 
Um, like this screen. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, so I'm going to start by by playing the, just the very beginning of an example that I played yesterday, but now I'm going to visualize it. Um, so you're going to see a spectrogram, and to the left of the vertical line is is represents the recording that we did in near anechoic space. So you can imagine a choir in a room that has virtually no no reflectivity, no reverberation, and it's a super dry recording. So first of all, there's a problem there because when a chorus decides how to sing, they, they're, as I, as I said yesterday, in terms of, of uh, a performer adapting to a space, it's an unnatural environment, right? And so they have, to, they have to choose a tempo to sing in and they have to sort of listen to each other. And it's that already is a problem. So how to, how to circumvent this um, this this issue of recording in dry space in order to be able to add um, acoustics of another space is a problem. Now we're we're now dealing with that problem. With I mean, the solution that we have is we can recreate the acoustics of a space in a room and have the singers sing rec and record themselves and keep their dry signal, um, even though they're hearing themselves in a, in a, in a uh, virtual acoustic space. That's one technological giant step that, again, my graduate students made, um, and that's that's a big win. So when when you see the spectrogram cross, what if you look to the left, you're going to see the dry signal, and you'll see that um, you know. So this is this is a voice with the with the uh, uh, harmonic contents. So you see all the overtones, and because it's polyphonic, you're going to see sort of a mess of these voices. But you'll be able to track carefully all of those independent voices on the left side. What happens when it goes on to the right side is what you're hearing in the Duomo, right? And, um, and you know, yesterday I, I called it poetically uh, auditory chiaroscuro. This, um, this idea of, of blurring the sound, which for me is a hugely, a, a huge problem in terms of understanding the aesthetics. Let, let me just play a bit of this. Thanks. So, so you can see how blurred the sound gets when it's in the church, right? Literally, um, all of the all of the separation of of the polyphonic voices are completely obscured, right? Um, and so we're hearing. We're hearing the beginning of, of individual notes, but we're losing all of the nuance in the in what happens. And, and so to um so the first technological problem that we're trying to solve is again how to how to record these these singers in a way that they're singing naturally in this in this virtual space. I mean, short of bringing them to the Duomo. And A, we can't do that routinely, and B, um, it's not the same Duomo as it was in, in at the time. Um, but um, so the question is, which is more sacred? Yeah, excellent question. <laughs> um, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass over that right now because I'm sure we're gonna get that to, back to that a number of times today. Um, let me just let's click ahead to the next slide. Sorry. Mm -hmm. We did this before. Yes. Yeah. Uh, one second. Yeah. Okay. So that um, I'll just go on. So that's that's question number one of ecological valid validity problem. The um, so again to to um, reiterate that first set of experiments that we did in in um, Florence. So we simulated the acoustics of the Duomo. And we simulated the acoustics of San Lorenzo, two churches um, with very different histories. But the the year the the cupola was put by Brunelleschi in the in the Duomo, he also was working on this very um, um, Renaissance, Renaissance 
structure that's just two blocks away. This was the, the Lorenzo de' Medici's um, church with a flat roof and entirely different acoustics. Um, I'm not sure if we're gonna be able to hear. Let's use the knob. Okay. Let's scroll down the mouse. No, okay, so um, these these examples are not working. I, I'll be very happy to share them afterwards. So, so the next example was um, a work by Marco de Galliano, a Renaissance composer who wrote music both for the for for San Lorenzo and for the Duomo. Musicologists have no clue if he wrote for either space. In fact, most musicologists um, say it just doesn't matter. Um, it, for me, it matters greatly. So, um, so we're now going through all of this, all of the music that we have of the Gallianos, and trying to trying to infer from the rate of harmonic change if it makes more sense to be heard in San Lorenzo or in the Duomo, right? So, um, so that's that's our our next problem here. Um, okay. Please scroll down. The all right. So, um, okay, so I said yesterday, so we have this stage of collecting data. We go to these, these wonderful places. We've done, um, we've done uh, two, three places in Florence. We've gone to Mantua and done Santa Barbara, a church that, um, for which Monteverdi was, uh, uh, was involved and some, some of the great composers of, of that area. We just came back from Venice, where we, record, where we measured the Ospedaletto, a church where, um, where uh, um, where music was written much later during the Baroque period, and and um, and this music is much more highly ornamented, um, and so we're interested in again the way the music works in these spaces. Um, so now we reanimate these spaces, and now we bring um, we do two things: we bring um, performers into these spaces and have them perform in the space. And again, we figured out um, my students have figured out. How to record them such that they're 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 performing with the virtual acoustics, listening to the virtual acoustics as if they're in the space, but we were able to preserve their voices without any acoustic um, um, uh, nuance. So we're so so it's um, it's dry, and then we can process it in different ways. Um, the other thing we're doing is bringing listeners into the space and be and um, and have them. Ha uh, trying to chart the differences of, of their reactions in these two different spaces. This brings up the whole issue of how do you chart someone's reactions, right? And, um, and now we're on this sort of weird borderline between behavioral and trying to do, um, do validity studies. So, um, you know, we're just entering this world where everyone in this room is way ahead of me, where um, where um, EEG is being used and eye tracking, we imagine will be used, um, putting it in virtual reality space. All of this stuff is is uh, on tap to use, but I have to admit that I'm entirely unclear what we will get from it. Um, so I think one of the one of the factors that's that's come up in the last day is this idea of, I know Robin mentioned it, and Julio mentioned it, and a number of speakers mentioned it, where you walk into a space and your head goes up and your mouth drops, right? So there's this, there's this initial reaction, a physiological reaction that happens in, um, in great spaces or in sacred spaces. Um, there's another reaction that we know of called the Frisson effect, where, um, you know, where, where you get a sense of chills or pyloerection, um, a little bit of, of uh, you know, you, you shake, you sort of lose control momentarily. Um, and that is associated both with um, with fear and with awe and with a sense of of, of, um, of just losing track. And we're interested in, in, in noting that. So we can get responses from that. Um, it's not clear to me how clean we can get these responses from um, from doing um, from doing other, you know, I, I've had absolutely no luck with physiological responses, with getting getting um, responses from sweat or or or, um, or uh, heartbeat. The noise is terrible. The um, the um, the um, 
uh, the data is it has to be denoised. And so so I mentioned that with our with EEG, where we're using intersubject correlation. Can we go ahead add a slide? Um, oh yeah. So um, let me okay, I'm I'm gonna back backtrack here. So um, so another thing we're doing is putting is is using virtual reality and um and we've we've figured out a method of of spatializing the sound in VR space so, so that as you traverse through the space um you you are you you become acoustically aware of how close you are or how far you are or where you are in in relation to um to a sound source so this is an example of yeah play this this is an example of um of the Chavot cave a model of the Chavot cave in France where um, where our students are now um, doing uh, acoustical tests. Um, so this is a, a model based on photogrammetry of that cave. And that blue spot is the sound source. Um, it's hard to hear it in, in here, but um, if you heard it in, a, in a space with spatial audio, it'd be very clear how far you are from that sound source, right? So, um, so we're doing this in in all the spaces that we're that we've studied, so that in the future when we figure out just how to get how to how to acquire the data and do with it what we want, we'll have the methodology to have people um, experience these spaces in in uh, virtual reality. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is work that was done a few years ago by one of my PhDs, Blair Conoshero. Who's uh, who was working on um, intersubject correlation studies using EEG, um, and and here sort of as an alternate uh, alternate way of um, of evaluating EEG data, the idea is to look across subjects who hear entire pieces of music or experience long periods of of time, um, and and here it's sort of out of the out of the uh, laboratory situation of what's typically used with EEG studies, which are sort of short, highly controlled snippets, which are using sign tones and whatever. So these are these are um, song, natural songs. They have uh, another problem of, uh, of data acquisition. This is sort of the, the another example of the real world problem is uh, when you get undergraduates into a, a, um, into a, a, a study, an experimental study, um, it's hard to to do uh, to do a study of music because the only music that most undergraduates know are pop songs with vocals, right? And because pop songs with vocals have um, have identifiable language words, um, we we had to figure out a way of doing this. So um, so we we used uh, um, uh, we used um, pop songs from. Um, um, the name just escaped me. Um, from Indian mo movies, from Hindu Hindu movies that are um, that are that, you know have this sort of super popular. They're almost almost Western style music, but um, but have these little twists and turns. And the only condition that we had for the subjects, besides the standard ones, mm -hmm. is that they they did not speak the, um, the languages of these songs, right? So that there was a sort of foreign language element to it, right? So in this chart. Um, whatever peaks above that, above the gray line, are places that are um, that we mark as sort of engaging across a, a, a wide number of subjects, right? And in this case, these songs are all blocked out by segmentation boundaries of of different um, of different uh, parts of the song. And you notice that when a vocal comes in or at the end of a of a segment, that's when there's sort of this group collective engagement, right? So we're able to sort of uh, validate the idea that people are, are um, that, that subjects listening over time, over for an entire piece of music, they're responding to, um, to certain changes in the music, um, whether they're, they're consciously thinking about it or not. I hit my last slide. Um, we can go beyond that. Um, yeah, go one more. So, um, so I, um, Julio asked us to uh, to say what are the biggest challenges here. Biggest challenges are um, that there's too much to do and life is too short. 
But I think really what we're what we're talking about here, and this is sort of the recurring theme that's that's sort of underlying this, is that um, that the the division between science and art is this really blurry uh, problem that we're facing, and um, and I'm not entirely convinced that we have, with all the tools that we've been looking at, we haven't really gotten to that point where we can, you know, where we can make these, these great assumptions. So, um, so uh, I'm gonna just leave off the machine. I'll, I'll be happy to talk afterwards about uh, what we're doing with machine learning, but um, I'll just leave it at that. So we'll move to a, We'll hold the question and then uh, we have a question for, with the entire panel. So the second speaker is uh, Elizabeth Kanepa, and then uh, uh, she is an architect and researcher from Genova, Italy. She is the Mary Curie Fellow running a resonance project at the University of Genova, Kansas State University, and Arbog University. Her research focuses on architecture, atmosphere, embodiment theory empathic relations between humans and space, and the experimentation in virtual reality. Uh, her presentation is titled, Resonance and Attunement, how to apply phenomenology and neuroscience to the study of priming potential of uh, architectural atmosphere. Please. Thank you so much. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. So I feel very excited to be here again after yesterday discussion. Uh, today presentations intends to integrate um, the framework provided with my first talk. Ah, uh, yeah, there is the okay. One of the most challenging <laughs> uh, questions designers have ever asked about their disciplines is what we mean by architecture. Uh, many explanations have been offered. And Mr. Le Corbusier gave us a, an answer more than 90 um, years ago. He said that architecture is an act of conscious willpower. To create architecture is to put in order, put what in order? Functions and objects, to occupy space with buildings and with roads, to create containers to shelter people and useful transportation to get to them to move by the play of perceptions to which we are sensitive and to and which we can avoid. Spaces, dimensions, and forms into your spaces, into your forms, into your pathways, and exterior forms, exterior spaces. Quantities, weights, distances, atmospheres, it is with these that we act. Let's systematize uh, his words a little bit, keeping step-by-step step only what we consider essential. We might say that architecture is to occupy, occupy space, to create containers to shelter people, to move by the play of perceptions, spaces, dimensions, and forms, quantitative space, distances, and atmospheres. Even better, with fewer words, we might say that architecture is to move by the play of perceptions, spaces, dimensions, and forms. Quantities, weights, distances, and atmospheres. In a nutshell, a Corbusier lecture on the essence of daily architectural practice could be condensed into an highly evocative image. Architecture is atmosphere. As much the physical components that configure and functionalize spaces as boundaries, surfaces, and objects, as the emotional charge space emanates, that is its atmosphere, are necessary to define the identity of the stage architectural event. There are complementary entities uh, that integrate and reinforce each other. Only in this way does architecture come alive and become atmosphere, that is space that lives. To empirically investigate the atmospheric vocation of uh, the architectural experience, uh, we design a scientific method embedding a multi-perspective approach, grounding on this dualistic idea that architecture is atmosphere. So we have architecture and atmosphere, attunement and resonance, 
appraisals and first impressions, conscious and no conscious, feelings and emotions, first person perspective and third person perspective, felt body and living body, phenomenology and neuroscience, self prep evaluations and physiological measures. Resonance is the no conscious immediate arousal of the first impressions that shape our experience of space. Because there is a distinction between perceiving the presence of an atmosphere, that is what we call resonance, and emotionally becoming aligned with, it, with this atmosphere. That is what we call in our research attunement. Because we can feel in tune with a specific atmosphere, but we can also remain insensitive or reject that atmosphere. For example, saying that we grasp the cheerful atmospheres of a party doesn't mean that we must feel happy ourselves as well. Attunement is the act of appraising an atmospheric event, particularly relevant for the uh, subject in which we evaluate its effective con content by relating the external world to our uh, self-experience, influenced by our current mood, motivation, concerns, uh, and expectations. We assign to the situation, to the place, a meaning grounding in that which our resonance gives us. In search for the inequitable quality of architectural space, the study of atmospheres has been dominated by a phenomenological approach focus on understanding the lived body, that is the body experienced from the first person perspective. What has changed in recent years is the increased emphasis on the living body, the biological organisms responsive to sense impressions, uh, which has been nudged by discoveries in new theories, for example, in neuroscience. Neuroscience can shed new light in the increased can sh uh, shed light on the lived body by investigating uh, the living body of which the brain and the autonomic nervous system are constituent parts. To analyze our atmospheric experiences, we need both. We need the lived body and the living body. We need a first person perspective and a third person per perspective. We need phenomenology and we need biology. One of the crucial questions, as Professor Michael Arby um, recalls us, is how we can link a growing understanding and systematization of architectural atmospheres to the study of the body, brain, and their emotional related mechanisms to best understand people's emotional complexity. The first step in our case, in our research, was building um, the atmospheric equation to better understand which determinants influence if and how uh, we experience architectural atmospheres. We identify five categories of determinants. The physiological determinants are those factors related uh, to the structural properties of our the human body, such as age, gender, interoceptive sensitivity, and so on. Personal determinants are those factors conditioned by pressures from the body, which oscillate between inborn and acquired skills, as well as permanent traits and transitory inclinations, such as the current mood state or our personality, our empathic sensitivity, and emotional intelligence. Sociocultural patterns trigger and affect our emotional reactions to atmospheric affordances by acting upon our bodies, as in the case of sociocultural background, education, or atmospheric expertise. Um, different aspects of the physical environment interact with our bodies, such as architectural properties and ambient qualities. Eventually, experimental conditions um, further influence the atmospheric equation, such as the lab setting, the employee devices and sensors, tasks to be performed, and as in our experiment developed in virtual reality, um, the perceived sense of presence and immersion. As architects, um, our target is to focus on spatial factors, but we need to consider the overarching complexity of the equation to best design our experimental paradigms. So here is the constellations of data collected and ready to be analyzed in the first resonances project. We have 
sociodemographic data, personal data, physiological data, behavioral data, and cognitive data. Now let's see briefly and quickly more in detail uh, the information we worked on. So during the pre-experiment interview, we collected some basic sociodemographics, such as age, gender identity, school level, job profile, and experience in using VR technology. In the same interview, we made some questions about the participants' current mood, their general health conditions, and if they had drunk coffee and exercised in the last few hours. Not because we were curious about their morning routines, but just to understand if there was an effect on some physiological parameters. And we gave them three preliminary self-report questionnaires. With the first um, questionnaire, we aim to study if emotional intelligence, namely the ability to recognize, understand, and describe our emotions correlates with our resonance sensitivity. Because when we work with experiments about feelings and emotions, we think that people can describe how they feel, but it isn't true. Um, we saw also with our experiments, some people just say, oh, I'm okay. <laughs> and other people can use different, I don't know, like 50 different adjectives. So we have different emotional granularities. Since our emotional intelligence correlates with, to our personality, we also add a personality test to understand if personality conditions how we experience architectural atmospheres. Finally, we thought that the more the subjects are interpersonally um, empathic, the higher their activation in terms of arousal can be when they resonate um, with a particular atmosphere. This slide recaps our experiment as we saw yesterday. So in summary, each session was composed of four sequences presented in random order and explorable in virtual reality. People enter the first room and run a breathing exercise to let us collect some baseline, baseline physiological data. The participant opened um, the first door and walked along the corridor. Corridors changed each sequence there was, as we said, uh, we saw yesterday, a bright corridor, an amber corridor, a blue corridor, and a quite dark corridor. Then the participant opened the second door. They had the, a touch controller, so they were completely autonomous in this operation. And they could also hear the sound of the sliding door um, and explore the art installation in front of them before replying a brief questionnaire. The first room and the final room never change. So every time, same proportion, same geometry, same colors, same light qualities, and same objects. During the virtual uh, reality walk, we monitored and collected four categories of physiological data. Electrodermal activity, heart rate, skin conductance, um, skin temperature, sorry. And we were also able to analyze eye movements thanks to the eye tracking te technology embedded in the virtual reality headset. In terms of explicit behavior, we mon monitored how much time people spend in each corridor to see if there may be a correlation between the atmospheric primers and their speed. Eventually, on the conscious side, once people were in the final room, we asked them seven questions to assess if and how their perception and emotional engagement with the surroundings changed due to the priming effect of the corridor's atmosphere. So the first questions check if their visual perception was altered because they walked through different light conditions. We asked them, what time of the day do you think is now in VR? Just to see if, for example, after the dark corridor, they perceive the finer and darker. The other six questions study resonance in terms of arousal, balance, and dominance, and analyze the attunement process by observing agency, sense of presence, and approach avoidance appraisals. At the end of the experiment, participants join us 
uh, join our debriefing sessions where they reported if they sense motion sickness, how much they enjoyed the experiment, and if they understood our research purpose. We asked some questions to see if participants understood that the corridor was the, the crucial element in the overall sequence, and if they noticed any difference among the four corridors. It could seem a very easy questions, but not, not all the subjects saw differences among the corridors. There were some subjects that told me, oh no, yeah, the corridor was always the same because they were so focused on the task, so they didn't perceive different light conditions. Finally, we asked people if they noticed any difference in the final room and how they evaluated the sensation of being immersed in this unique uh, blue light. Again, to recap, here are the data we collected uh, to study the priming potential of architectural atmospheres by integrating phenomenology and neuroscience. So for us now, the biggest and urgent challenge is to combine these ocean of numbers and um, and data to see how we can make them uh, to talk to each other. More than eight individuals joined our test sessions in addition to the 20 participants for the pre-test. And we try to engage a very heterogeneous sample in terms of gender, age, background, and education. So to recap, we didn't study, as we said yesterday, atmosphere per se, but as a priming condition for the spatial experience. Because if we can see some differences in the first impressions in the, fi in the final room, that difference can somehow uh, prove the presence of an enough fascinating atmosphere in the corridor. So we can see something that in theory it's invisible thanks to that difference. And just think how much an entrance, a corridor, or a room can prime the upcoming experience, nurturing that experience as it usually happens, for example, in a church. So how much important is this um, first experience with the building? Because the priming potential of atmosphere is a deep-rooted intuition among designers. Uh, but we want to consolidate evidence. We want to transform a design intuition into an informed intuition. So we are almost sure that it works, but we have to double check. Okay, I think maybe I'm a little late. So thank you so much for your attention. Okay, um, next speaker is the Professor Lin Jin Cheng. She is from uh, Catholic University of uh, America. And uh, Professor Chen is the, uh, in the Computer Science Department, uh, Director of Computational Informatics Laboratory, uh, Director of uh, Data Analysis Progr Analytics Programs at the, here at the CUA. Her research interests span both artificial intelligence and software engineering. Much of her work has been focused on developing computational methods and machine learning algorithms for uh, computational neuroscience, medical image processing, and data analytics. Uh, so please. Uh, thank you, Yushi, for the introduction. And thank you, Julio, for having me and uh, my student at work to work on this project. So this is our team. And we also have a group of wonderful students from architecture who did the data collection. We love them. Uh, this cannot be done. But I don't have space to put everybody. So uh, for thousands of years, architect has designed building either a subquit space or scalar space to create specific spiritual state for those people view and enter in there. However, until the present day, the only way we test the effectiveness of the design is to observe or survey those people who enter in those buildings, right? Artificial intelligence in 21st century, it probably is very difficult to image the life without land. The history of artificial intelligence has been up and down. 
And we are not talking about uh, those application, but uh, we want to know this uh, artificial intelligence bring us a lot of benefit, but the controversy is also clear. The aesthetic experience also has been studied in many different ways. So for example, uh, when you view your uh, art and try to see is it beautiful or not, or it, it try to uh, you know, evaluate the artwork, you can come from a formalist approach, you can come from contextual approach, and there's a researcher in Germany that proposed to combine universal beauty and the cultural context to analyze the future aesthetic experience. And obviously this is not my field of study. So today what we try to ask ourselves is, can we use machine learning with mobile EEG data to analyze cognitive aesthetic experience. And yesterday, more than two people asked me, why am I here? Because I'm a computer scientist. Now I show you, we do have a lot in common and overlap, right? So if you want to do anything computational, then you need a computer scientist. So uh, just some background information in terms of how people design a brain computer interface. Obviously you need to have some data, acquire some data. Data can be any type of form like EEG, like a medical scan, CT, MRI. Those data often need a pre-processing. And after that, we extract useful information. We call it feature. And then we can uh, take those feature as an input to a machine learning algorithm. And then at the end, we get the answer we want and we feedback those answer to the device and then to your uh, brain computer interface application. So our architecture follow similar philosophy. We have this uh, mobile EEG device. We collect EEG signal. And then we fit those signal into machine learning and at the end, we will be able to build a model that tell a person is in which building. And here we choose two building, Union Station, and uh, there is uh, and, uh, a Belisica. So when we choose these two buildings, they are both beautiful and they are similar in size, but the main reason you probably will have to ask Julio, the data we collect, since Julio already spent some time uh, talking about data, I will not go into the too detail. We have 32 subjects, but at the end, around uh, 29 subject is included in our study. So uh, the next, I want to talk about the measure we developed. So we have a full data processing pipeline as you already know, we have this mobile EEG device. It get the raw EEG signal. We have to spend a lot of time to pre-process this signal because they are very noisy. There is artifact, there is unwanted signal get into the main signal and we have lost channels or lost data. After we do this pre-processing, we need to do uh, feature extraction. And there is, again, several ways to do feature extraction. For example, uh, Fourier transform. And here we use fast Fourier transform. We can also do wavelet transform, but this is the, the method we choose. We will be able to get four different uh, wave and you probably know about beta, alpha, theta, and delta. After that, we have to, uh, th those signals are continuous and we cannot analyze the whole signal at once because then there is not enough data point for us to do machine learning. 
So I, I will go back to uh, feature extraction later. And then after that, we input those features to machine learning model. And we also try several models like random forest uh, support vector machine. And at the end, we have our uh, final model. So talking about our first challenge is how do we process our raw EEG signal? We know EEG signal are very noisy in nature. They have a small SNR. And like I mentioned earlier, unwanted signal contained in the main signal, uh, such as artifact from different noise source, external and environmental. And also as a, each human being, we have physiological uh, source. So Jonathan mentioned uh, yesterday, how we uh, accommodate the sound factor. And that was actually my first question to Julio because we are not acquire EEG signal in a, in a closed space, it's an open space. So there will be voice come from the environment, maybe music, maybe other people talking so loud maybe a police car outside the building, or maybe it is a raining day, so there is thunder. And the other thing is uh, for EEG data, it's very difficult to get useful information directly from the Thai domain. And that's why we need to do this uh, pre-processing best Fourier transform to get useful information. So, uh, I'd like to show this slide to uh, indicate how we did that. And then also the meaning of each, each wave. And I'd like to point out uh, these three. So uh, gamma is when we are in the hyperactivity state and beta is just active thinking. And then delta is deep sleep. All right, feature extraction. So once we have our wave, we take one second and then we compute some uh, feature from it. So for example, we want to uh, get the mean, the medians, how many times it crossed the zero, the variance, entropy, and the mean square. And after that, we will have uh, express it quite big, and that contain all the information that we can fit into machine learning model. Oh. So that's our second challenge, how to extract useful information. We try several ways and then at the end, that is what we decide to use. Another challenge we are facing is this intra or intersubject model. So at the very beginning, we say we definitely want to build an intersubject model that we can use in the future. But uh, since not go the way we want. So before I talk about our result, and uh, I like to mention about what is intra and inter subject model. So obviously intra subject mean we take the data from individual subject and then train our model using a single person's data. The inter subject model means uh, we take, we have 29 subject. So we take 28 subject for training and one subject for testing. And we repeat this 29 times. So for the uh, intra-subject model, we do it person by person. So at the end, we have 29 model. And you can see this is a very labor intensive and I will give all the credit to Edward. So here is our result. Uh, yesterday, Julio showed you a case that is too good to be true. 
He showed you the subject 40A and we have the intra subject model reach 98% of uh, accuracy. So here, this is the average. And we do have two subjects that in intra subject model, have two subjects, the accuracy is around 40A50. So what does that mean? That is equally to random guessing. So if we remove those two, then we can have uh, the accuracy up to maybe 83. So the inter-subject model, if we include all 29 subjects, you can see what's the accuracy, 50%. So it's equally good as random guessing, right? And then we start asking ourselves, can we do a better job? So we have uh, include only 21 object that has high F1 score. So I, high F1 score mean um, the accuracy are equally good in identify both this car and Union Station. However, uh, we didn't get data result. The result improved a little bit, almost nothing. Then we say, how about we take the gamma feature only because uh, we have small data size. And then uh, if we take too many feature, then the model complexity is very high. And for people who work in the data analytic field knows if you reduce the number of the sample and uh, number of the dimension, then you can reduce the model complexity. So if we take gamma only, then uh, again, the accuracy increase a little bit, not as the way we hope. So um, another thing we try is because uh, we know the EEG signal are very noisy and uh, Julio and you should design the experiment as there is five stop. So stop three and four are the subject, they, they don't move, they just stand in in the main building, the main uh, space. So if we only take the data from stop three and stop four, and we still use the whole uh, space of the feature, and that's the um, accuracy we receive, and we see some hope. And we, but we stop here, and the reason we stop here is uh, we realized probably build an inter-subject model at this point using this small data set may not be too meaningful. We do need more data to accommodate the inter and intra the, the inter-subject variability. So uh, you remember I mentioned the uh, different band earlier, and as you can see here, if you do analysis and then try to see what information get fit into the machine learning for us to have those results, then you see the gamma band contribute 66% and the beta 11%. And that's good, right? Because those are, uh, indicate your human uh, brain, human brain activity. But we also see this uh, delta wave contribute 16%. So to my surprise, I say, this is when you are deep sleep. How can this get into machine learning model? Then I read some uh, article and they told me, actually the delta wave indicate your unconsciousness, unco unconsciousness. I don't know, uh, some neuroscientists can tell me if that's true or not, okay? But to be able to tell how much, that is already a very interesting found finding in my view. Okay. So uh, we said maybe we can further reduce the data dimension by doing regional analysis. And with the input from Mohammed, 
we now try to do regional analysis. Oh, sorry, too fast. So we divide it into six regions, and then we try to analyze if we only take the data from one region, will we be able to get a better result in intersubject model? But uh, unfortunately, we don't. Okay, so that's part of reason we say maybe built in an intersubject model at this moment. We are not there yet. We are not ready. We need much more data. So um, that is what I have. That's a summary of our project one. For project two, we haven't done any data analysis yet because we are still acquiring data. So to recap the challenge we are facing, the first one is the EEG data preprocessing. That's very difficult, but uh, we try our best. We are able to rescue 29 subjects, but a, a few are not that good. And uh, feature engineering, there is so many ways to extract feature. Right now we take one second and we do fast Fourier transform. There has some other way, maybe two seconds is better or four seconds is better. We don't know. Another uh, challenge we are facing is there are too many possible ways to perform our analysis. As you see, uh, we do the regional analysis and we divide the brain to six region. Maybe we can divide it to two left brain and right brain, or we can divide it to three region, just so many. And also, are you including only gamma band or maybe gamma and delta and gamma and theta? Who knows? And the last is this intersubject variability. And until we have more money, we acquire more data. And also, we cannot just look at two buildings. We need many, many buildings, many, many volunteers. And at that time, we will be ready to build an intersubject model. And the model will be able to, you know, tell you are in which kind of split your stay in the future. Thank you. And uh, the, there's one interesting uh, slide I want to show you. So if I now ask you, can we use AI and mobile EEG? to analyze cognitive aesthetic experience? I think the answer is yes, but there is a lot of technology behind it. And then we can do it now, we can do it better. So I did a test. I asked Chat GPT, <laughs> can you do that? And the answer is, of course, yes, I can do that. And then it, it start to explain uh, what technology behind it. And for example, the mobile EEG device we bought two years ago, now they have a better one. And even at two years ago, they have a better one we can purchase, but because of the price, we didn't get the top line. And for machine learning, there is always new algorithm developed modified every day. So I do have a good hope in the future, we will be able to, to do that. Okay, that concludes my presentation. Well, thank you, but uh, you don't believe anything you get from GPT-4. So, <laughs> so the, we have last speaker for uh, this morning session, uh, doc Dr. Zach uh, Jabara. Uh, Dr. Zach Jabara is a currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Arbach University, focusing on the role of architectural affordances in cognition and behavior by use of mobile EAG, VR, computational neuroscience. Dr. Jabara is an anti-disciplinary researcher, meaning he refused to be confined by disciplinary kind of boundaries and set of assumptions and so on, because he traveled from many, you know, across many different domains. So, and then he's currently investigating how unconscious sensory motor brain dynamics modulate behavior and cognition. Um, 
seen that it's um, quite clear from the past few uh, presentations that to do a experiment with architecture is not an easy thing. It's not so trivial, and you need to really account for a bunch of things. So, um, so I can talk. Ah, okay. Yeah, yes. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Um, so just uh, to uh, kudos to uh, to the presenters before. That's fantastic work. I'm very happy to see all that. Um, from the presentation yesterday, I promised that I will be talking a bit more about the methodologies that I use uh, in the cross section of architecture and neurophenomenology. Briefly, uh, I will speak about the um, the synchronization uh, between empirical measures and uh, of the body with the with the measures of space. And I will speak a bit about that if we assume that the neurophenological project of architecture is a relational one, then what really does that mean for us as architects and people who want to understand the, the effect of architecture? Then I will also talk a bit about computational models um, and how they are practical for uh, generating empirical testable hypothesis, which I think is at the core of what we're trying to, to, to do here. So there are several ways in which we can try to capture uh, brain and body information, and you probably know some of these brief abbreviations, um, fMRI, fNERS, MEG, and so on, but I specialize in working with mobile EEG. So more specifically, what is called the mobile brain body imaging technique, uh, in which we integrate motion capture, eye tracking, GSR, ECG, mobile EEG, and so on, and you can literally add to this list as you want, depending, of course, on the question. So uh, we recently um, presented or published our paper on uh, the uh, Berlin mobile uh, EEG pi uh, pipeline, um, which includes all of these things that I just measured, uh, uh, mentioned. And uh, one additional point that we are currently working on is to basically not only rest on data-driven approach, uh, approaches, but also flip it around and talk about hypothesis-driven approaches. And this is more specifically the dynamic causal modeling approach, which I will elaborate on um, in a later slide. So how do we capture? So basically in, in here we have, uh, we've captured uh, brain and body, but of course we're not only interested in the brain and body, we're of course also interested in the environmental features. So how do we sort of try to include that? Well, we use measures of virtual reality, augmented reality, and we use a combination of motion capture with ISO, uh, ISOVIST. And uh, more recently, um, we, are, we have begun to use what is called the visual simultaneous mapping and localization, which is an algorithm that I will explain in a second. We, we, um, it's called the VSLAM. It uh, was introduced to me by uh, two PhD students in Algeria. Um, so basically how it works is that with a single video camera, um, you can extract features that are unique to that frame and the, uh, the frame before, so the previous frame, and it will try to track exactly the change and uh, try to estimate the depth and the distance between these points. And essentially what happens is that you try, it will eventually try to map the environment, the 3D environment. Um, at the same time, it's trying to estimate the trajectory of the camera itself. So the person who's moving, if you attach the camera to your person. And essentially what happens is that uh, over the course of, uh, well, depending on how long your camera is, uh, the, the video recording, you will get an estimation of the 3D environment and also a trajectory of the movement, which is, of course, what we're interested in, here, the relationship between these two things. More importantly, um, all of this can be directly synchronized one-to-one -one, uh, at, uh, at, at the precision of a, a thousand of a millisecond to uh, your EEG data, to your uh, GSR, to your ECG, and so on. So I will not speak a lot about ISOVIST. I think most of you architects here, you've heard about it, right? So it's a point in space that, they, that is going to represent a user and you can add a direction to this point. A field of view can also be added. You can also add a path or just take a simply uh, exploratory approach. Uh, and basically you can compute the, um, well, all of the measures that, uh, that are available from the ISOVIST community. This is all interesting, but um, from a behavioral point, point of view, what's interesting uh, is, is that it has been associated with a, a, a spatial experience and behavior. And more importantly, it has also been associated with a, a, a relevant features for locomotion, right? So it's also important for how we, how we move in space. 
Um, so this makes isobis quite interesting in the, in the sense that it qualifies as a hypothesis generator for upcoming experiments. So in other words, what I'm trying to say here is you can use features of isovist to predict the outcome of your experiment in a behavioral uh, dimension. So what's an example of, of, uh, of using the isovist? Well, we all know that, well, cities have different uh, infrastructure and different movement patterns. And well, with these movement patterns comes a lot of action sequences that you can model using a Bayesian network in which you can then uh, use the, uh, uh, the, the isovist measures, create them into a time series and, you, and feed that into the Bayesian network. And you can start to figure out, well, what kind of movements would most likely uh, occur in this context. And of course, the isovist is uh, uh, rightfully criticized for being too two dimensional, um, whereas world is experienced in 3D. So fear not, Krukar and uh, colleagues have uh, developed a 3D version uh, and uh, validated it as well. So here comes, I think, maybe uh, among the most important uh, slides. So Lab Streaming Layer is a uh, open source uh, free software uh, developed partly in Berlin and partly in uh, UCSD. Um, Basically, the idea of uh, lab streaming layer is a way to synchronize all the different kinds of measures that you want to, to look at at the same time. Basically, by setting up a lab streaming layer, you take the, uh, the timestamp of a network and you combine that with all the streams at the same time. So everything gets synchronized. And usually the way I do it is I, I use mobile EEG and I combine that with streams from motion capture, eye tracking, GSR, and ECG. I should probably also add others coming up. Um, so this is just an example from our paper showing exactly how we use it. Um, no later. Okay, so I'll use this cursor instead. So basically, we have a lot of raw EEG. Um, we have the whole pipeline, which is a specialized uh, pipeline for um, uh, cleaning uh, the data. We can com uh, combine that with uh, mobile uh, with motion capture from uh, basically the body, and we will extract uh, events. Uh, from from the, this combination of of, uh, of uh, data streams, and eventually allows us to look at exactly what happens in the brain and the body at the same time with the various uh, visualization uh, uh, techniques. And we have also uh, implemented um, well the trail map of eye tracking and uh, created uh, well heat maps of of the eye tracking, which is directly subjective to um, to uh, statistical measures directly from from the pipeline. So it's uh, almost like ready to go as you download the pipeline. And of course, we want to synchronize this with the VSLAM that I showed before with the ISOVIST and another project that we're working on, uh, which is uh, the visual dynamics and, and the rhythms uh, of, of the visual uh, uh, stimuli. What I find very interesting is the fact that, well, with uh, LSL, you are not limited to a single um, to a single participant. You can couple another participant to the same stream, and you will have one-to-one -one, uh, streams with two participants, which allows for the social aspect of architecture to be evaluated. And I'm just bringing up this. Uh, so this is actually called hyperscanning in the community of EEG. Um, I want to just bring up this study uh, from a colleague of mine, uh, Giovanni Vicchiato. Um, who started now to actually open up this possibility to understand, well, how do we understand other people if you change the environment? It's a very fascinating study. It's just uh, an early study. There is no EEG involved in this one, but I, uh, um, they're planning on, on adding, to, uh, to, uh, adding the EEG level as well. Now, this brings me to the computational part. Um, so computational neuroscience is typically something we associate with some kind of post hoc uh, analysis, typically data driven, but you can also have a priori um, hypothesis driven uh, analysis. Um, what's, what's important here when I talk about uh, computational phenomenology is I think about it more as a, a hypothesis generator in the sense of what do we expect our participants to experience. Um, so um, in, 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 the, in the field of neurophenomenology, uh, we have been talking a lot about the mutual constraints, which plays a central role of neurophenomenology. In fact, neuro was just added to phenomenology as a response to the emerging field of neurophilosophy. Uh, so it has nothing really, it's not really neurocentric, it's neurocentric in the sense that, that we like to think about it. 
Uh, these are the words of Francisco Varela, uh, who introduced the uh, neurophenology. So when we talk about the mutual constraint, um, what are we really talking about, right? Uh, is this about the neuroscience and the phenomenology, or can we be more general and talk about, well, is it the nature and the phenomena, or even more, can we get even more uh, uh, into the bone of this issue and talk about, well, is this really the question about the quantity and the quality? Right, because we have a quantitative measure of space, but we have a qualitative experience of that space. Now, is it really that what we're trying to understand, the relationship between these two things and how they mutually constrain each other? If this is the case, and this is the case if you approach this problem from a computational phenology uh, approach, well, in that case, we are, we are, you have another uh, problem, really, because in that case, you have a group of people who are trying to quantify the quality, and you have another group of people who work in computer science in which you have a perhaps a generative model with a specific number of parameters. And one of these parameters will try to explain the, the experience of attention. Well, in that case, you have a what you have a single parameter trying to explain what attention is. And that's the exact opposite of quantifying quality. I think of it as qualifying quantity. That's a very specific quantity with a very specific quality. So a possibility of going beyond the isomorphism that we also talked about yesterday would be to use phenological insights to identify quantitative limits, but also the other way around to use neuroscientific insights to, to identify qualitative limits. And this is a case in uh, me and my good, co uh, my good colleague, uh, Juan Diego uh, Bogota. We, uh, we, we went with the first one. So that would be using phenological insights to identify quantitative limits. Um, so we, we both share the fact that we are Husserlian phenomenologists. We are very colored by his work. Uh, and we thought, well, because uh, we work in computer science as well, we thought, let's try to use some of the uh, principles we learned from uh, Husserl to, uh, and apply them to a very specific algorithm uh, that is called active inference. Um, so we basically took this idea of time consciousness and the structure of time uh, that allows you for an experience from Husserl, which uh, more or less looks like uh, yeah, the diagram up there. And we said, well, let's try to map that uh, onto um, the, the, the computational models. So all computational models uh, move forward in a sequential way. So they go, they go from one moment to another moment in a very discrete and sequential way. But the idea of uh, Hussar is the combination and integration of the past and the future, the retention and the protension into a single primal impression. So we thought, well, how would that look like in uh, the computational model that we are uh, assessing? And this, that's generally, that's essentially what it is. We're assessing a computational model using phenomenological insights. And we find that we can come up with something that we call the integrated continuity. Uh, more specifically, we also found out that the update function of the computational model uh, fits quite well with the idea of integrating the immediate past with the immediate future. So, but we also identified a lot of other issues. And if you're interested, I advise you to just read. Uh, so that's the final one, the final reference here. Uh, you will find uh, the details of this study. This was just an example to show how this mutual constraint can happen from one way at least. And now I think that the other way around should also be applicable. The hypothesis-driven approach in uh, phenomenology. Now I'm just briefly going to talk about dynamic causal modeling because I think that this is something that is uh, very strong. Um, um, methodologically speaking. So obviously I cannot measure direct uh, activity from the thalamus as I was claiming yesterday. Uh, it's practically impossible. Um, I mean, well, you have thalamic data in, the, in your data, but you don't know how much of the measured data is only thalamic. So how do you go about this? Well, you can rely on other studies because other studies that have been doing intracranial EEG will have a better understanding of the mechanisms. Sure, so we can go ahead and say, well, do we have a hypothesis about what kind of brain mechanisms would be involved in this case? Yes, sure we do. And so we use a biophysical model. Uh, and I, I contrast that a bit with the typical machine learning approach where it's just a black box doing some work. Because in this case, it's biologically informed predictions. So we build a model that, um, reflects the uh, the neural mechanisms from the neocortex all the way down to, to the thalamus. And the procedures, um, well, I guess the procedures don't really matter right now. Um, but it's a Bayesian approach, basically. So you will, you will basically have different kinds of models that you try to compete against each other, try to figure out which of these models best explain my data. So the limitation here is, of course, that you are not able to say that this is actually what's going on, but you're able to say that if 
this hypothesis is right, then this model best explains that data. So there is an inherent limitation to having this inferential approach. Conclusions. So uh, just going over what I, what I talked about. So I tried to answer how can we synchronize several modalities with space. I also tried to answer can neurophonology go uh, beyond the isomers, uh, isomorphism via mutual constraints. And essentially, I tried to, to answer, well, can or will computational models play a central role in neurophonology? And the reason I'm asking this last question is I just want to emphasize that um, to me, it only makes sense to talk about uh, to talk about neuroscience and architecture or neurophonology in the context of experimentation. Otherwise, I really don't see the value of it. And this is just my perhaps radical opinion, I'm not sure. But if that's the case, then we also need to think about how do we produce hypothesis? testable hypothesis. So that's why my last question here, we were asked to uh, end with an open question here. Um, well, is computational neurophenomenology inevitable in, in our case here of neurophenomenology? And if it's not, then what do we mean by mutually constrained? But if it is, then how do we go about the mutual constraining? Yes, thank you. But, yeah. So the three panelists, maybe they can come uh, come down. And then uh, uh, given time, maybe I will move to a question from audience. Yeah, sure. So uh, it was um, very exciting to hear a lot of this. And uh, I think all of you touch on a uh, kind of core question of how do we deal with this laboratory well-controlled study to taking things out into the wild and the kind of ecological validity. Uh, but across, I think, all the presentations, there's, I feel a deep worry. And, and the worry is that our abilities, technological abilities to gather data is outstripping our way to think about the data. And that potentially is a recipe for disaster five years down the road. And by that, what, by that I mean, uh, as many of you know, what has been going on in psychology and cognitive neuroscience for the last 10 years is this kind of replication crisis. Uh, and there's been this movement, uh, and I'm just saying, I'm sure most of you know this, but so that everybody knows what I'm talking about is, uh, within these sciences, there have been deep questions of what are we doing and are we doing this correctly? And it's a kind of corrective, a science hygiene question. And one approach to that that is used quite commonly now is to have things in an open science framework where before you actually do publish your results, you lay a stake in the ground, right? You register your reports. You say, this is my set of hypotheses. These are my predictions. And this is how I'm going to analyze the data beforehand. That way you don't go cherry picking the data after the fact to confirm something you think might be true. Now, this doesn't mean that you can't do purely exploratory uh, studies, which but those are identified beforehand that these kinds of analyses might be exploratory. And I think it's especially at this stage where there's so much data coming in to, to, to try to articulate what is it you are actually testing? What is your theoretical motivation for this? What are you testing? What are your predictions? When you've got 17 variables, I think it's absolutely critical to do that at this stage uh, and keep open the possibility that there are exploratory aspects to this, which I think to uh, point out something that Zach said, 
differentiating between confirming a hypothesis and generating new hypotheses that after you're still obligated to then go out and test after you've generated those hypotheses. So that's just, but the broader issue here for me is a, a deep worry that our ability to gather data, the technical abilities to gather data that what the engineers are allowing us to do is outstripping our ways, our ways to think about the data. Yeah, um, I think um, I completely agree uh, because I think that at heart I am uh, an experimentalist. I want to have generated a hypothesis and I want to test the hypothesis. But I want I would also like just to take a, a, a I want I want to praise the work of uh, Elisabeth Kanepa because what I saw in her presentation was deep thinking about the theory, deep thinking about what could it be like and then generating a hypothesis, what should it be like? And I think that that's a, a fantastic way to, to sort of go from, well, because there was a lot of measures involved for sure. Uh, and uh, well, uh, Dr. Kanepa might end up uh, finding unforeseen uh, relationships, but personally, I don't find them interesting. I, what I find interesting is the fact that she had a hypothesis and she worked to test to falsify the hypothesis. So I agree with you that the data, and you can see definitely from my work, I am uh, almost obsessed with finding ways to, uh, well, to reduce the noise and to find out how are they all related. And that, I agree with you, completely blocks my vision and I become obsessed with that instead of asking, uh, well, the more interesting question in the end. Um, but I would also say that with that possibility, you can finally, you know, lay back and say, now we can do some experiments. Well, if you have the money, at least. Uh, thank you so much, Anjan. Um, for me, this experience was a very challenging experience because for the first time in my life, I had a technique and some technologies where I wasn't able to foresee the results, the end. Every time in my life, which with any kind of technique of technology, I could see the light at the end of the tunnel. Okay, I can use this technology to get this kind of result. And this time is completely opposite. So it's true, I feel somehow lost, but using special people like Zach and other uh, incredible expert people, we are trying to combine knowledge from data. But yeah, there is this huge distance between technology and data management and knowledge. Thank you very much. I, I have two questions in general uh, and relates to the previous discussion. Um, would somebody give me an example of a hypothesis that might be tested with all this data, a hypothesis that would actually somehow relate to uh, the notion of the sacred. I mean, are we anywhere near answering this question um, when people encounter religious works of art, and I include music and so on, they are actually encountering, are they actually encountering the divine? That seems to me a good question, and that they, are, that they aren't would be the hypothesis. I'm just curious whether we're remotely near that with all the technological assistance that we have. But I had a more specific question just to ask Jonathan Berger, if I may. It sounds to me as though what you were doing had resonances with the authenticity movement in music some years ago. And so, uh, so very interesting. I mean, the original movement amongst those who believed in authenticity was to try and recreate the instruments. You are trying to recreate the acoustic. Uh, but it was an objection raised against the authenticity movement then, not just that uh, we couldn't create the uh, acoustic, because you're going to answer that now, or well, maybe, um, but that we hear and play uh, music from uh, 1600 in the light of all the music we played from 1800 or 1900. 
And it's impossible to strip away our enhanced musical understanding uh, back to where those who first listened to Victoria or whoever uh, were listening. And I just wondered whether you think that kind of objection vitiates what you're doing in the way that people thought it vitiated the uh, original instrument people. So um, let me let me try to conflate those two questions and then um, then I'll pass the microphone. So um, I don't think we're near anything. Um, I think and and just to you know to um, to to spring off uh, Anjan's question, for me, um, the race is to is to um, is to replicate before we start gathering data. So I'm I'm way behind the curve because we're still trying to find the tech the technologies and find through the technologies and the and and the technologies are changing so quickly that there's sort of a race to keep up. You know, as soon as I I find one way of doing something, one of my one of my new graduate students comes and says, well, but there's this better way. Um, and it is a better way. So um, so at some point we have to stop and say, this is enough. This is how we're doing it. And, um, um, and that's even before we gather the data that Anjan is worried about. Um, so yes, I think that that uh, technology is both a boon and, um, and a disaster for us. Um, the historically informed performance practice movement, um, which came and sort of went, but is still preserved in certain ways, um, never took into account um, the, the one premise that I, that I proposed, which is the, the space of place uh, 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 where music is heard or experienced is the musical instrument. And so that is, um, that's really the, 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 the one addition that I'm adding to the, to the uh, uh, formula here. For me, it's informing a lot about musicology um, and it's posing challenges and questions that not only affect that period of, you know, the 60s into the 70s of the historically informed performance practice movement, um, which I, you know, I feel that they just skirted over a massive amount of, of, of thought about the music itself. But I think it actually is, um, is giving us new insights into how music was conceived for these spaces. So in that sense, I'm hoping that there's some enlightenment to come out of that. Um, as far as, uh, yes, whatever someone is hearing, is they're hearing with a composite experience of all the music they've ever heard before. So, um, so if I've heard Stockhausen and then I hear uh, uh, De Victoria, um, there's some influence on that. There's no question about that. Um, so, so in a way, we're, we're, I'm asking two questions. I'm asking, can we reevaluate how music was conceived? And that's why um, I think um, I think just um, looking statistically, not at the listener, but at the mu at the corpus of music itself, and say, can we can we look at all of the all of this music written, and can we, you know, this can we infer that this music was really meant to be played in this space? That's a question that removes that experiential issue. Um, so that's a very good question. Uh, if you look at my title, the hypothesis, it's something impossible to answer at this point, right? We can only say maybe with a good hope, but yes. So to narrow down our hypothesis, now we ask ourselves, can uh, we tell a person is in Union Station or in Belisica, and then we only target an audience as a Catholic believer. And if we narrow down that hypothesis, then we will have ability to say what type of data we can collect. Yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, amazing presentations. And as a kind of um, synthesizer, I'd like to ask a question by putting forward what I thought I heard across presentations. So first of all, with Elisabetta, her experiments 
seem to be able to indicate that atmosphere matters. It does make a difference in measurable behavior. And found by, you know, your, your methods of the questionnaires and observation. So, and in my reading of all of this neuroscience, there are kinds of attention. And the suggestion is that the integrative or simultaneous perception that leads to this atmospheric response happens first, as opposed to sequential or more detailed analysis as to what makes the atmosphere. So in your data, the surprise was that there was a lot of unconscious stuff going on, which is where this simultaneous atmospheric integrative um, perception and cognition happens. So I'm wondering if Zach, I mean, it would be amazing if you could conclude that the hypothesis that this happens first, the atmosphere, the synthesis, the summary of all of this experience happens first, it would be nice to be able to really measure that and show that that happens. That might be something where yours was done by questionnaires and talking to the people and some observation, he's putting together both the brain and body and you could see if this unconscious, I don't know where it happens in the brain because I'm not a neuroscientist, if, if that's really a accurate hypothesis. So what I think is so interesting is by bringing all these things together, Julio, we're actually mapping out a landscape of hypotheses that we now can try to possibly test, right? That, that we could do experiments on. So I don't know if that's correct, whether your data showing that the unconscious activity was pretty important in terms of the experience of these students in those spaces. And is that confirming the idea that atmosphere happens first and matters? And, and can we measure that? Arizona, thank you so much for your question and your perfect recap. So um, this is the first step in that direction. So my dream, my hope, and so my homework for next year would be the tasks. So I'm so glad to be here with Zach and next week we will work together in Kansas to see how we can evolve this first paradigm. So that's why the Carter. So I'm very, 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 very interested in the no conscious reactions because the Carter is the most background environment ever. We usually don't pay attention to a Carter. It's just a Carter. <laughs> I have to open that door, but it can matter even if it's just a Carter. So yes, you design using much better words what will be our upcoming horizons. I'm here to learn. So the physiological challenge was my in-between step because since I don't have a computer science or biology background, I had to learn step by step. I will learn the entire life. So, that horizon will be the next stage that we will perform in Genoa with the Department of Neuroscience and Experimental Medicine next year. <laughs> okay, uh, we wish we had more time for discussion, but we have to end our session now. We can continue our discussion during the break. So, let me go and thank you.